we are, Rob, I can't say this strongly enough, a planet running out of, of, of accessible clean water. And it isn't just climate change. We always hear, oh, it's climate change created this drought. Well, maybe sure had a hand in it but it could also be because you damned the rivers all to death and you pulled up your groundwater way faster than nature can replenish it the ogallala aquifer is going to be gone in our lifetime I, people don't understand that technology that they developed after the second world war the circular uh, uh, groundwater technology that green the the deserts that'll be gone and when it's gone what will we use what will people use so we need to say water is a, a public trust, a commons, and a human right. And then you start to say, well, then what priorities do we place on it? And who has authority over access? This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an extraordinary guest. Maud Barlow from Canada is an activist and an author. She's written 19 books, and she focuses on many things for the common good, but most, most preciously, and I'm an Aquarian, water. I uh, have followed her work since I was involved in the UN Commission in 2008, and she was the special advisor to water there for the 63rd President of the United Nations General Assembly. She's the recipient of 14 honorary doctorates, as well as many other awards, and she won the 2005 Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel. She is someone who I've watched on film, Water on the Table, and a new film, I think it's called The Lords of Water, though I haven't seen the title page yet. I just got an advanced viewing. The combination of passion, intellect, and unrelenting nature is something I want to foreshadow for all of our young scholars who tune in today. So let's talk, let's start with, you've been doing this for years and years and years. I mean, 30, 40 years of depth and knowledge, but we just had a pandemic come out and uh, I use the silly joke, unmask many things that we need to address the fault lines and maladies of our society. How has the pandemic affected your vision and what you see in relation to water? Well, the most shocking thing, I guess, was when we first all learned about this COVID-19 back in March of 2020, we were told the most important thing to do is wash your hands with soap and warm water. And the United Nations immediately put out a statement saying, do we understand that over half the population of the world doesn't have a place to wash their hands with soap and warm water. Mm -hmm. And that was so stunning. I mean, I knew that, but I think for a lot of people, this was brand new. It's far away and nothing to do with them. And I think it's, it, it has, <clears throat> COVID has shone a spotlight on many, many, many things. Um, in a new book I'm writing on hope, I talk about what, came, what can come out of a bad time. Um, I like, and I use the Second World War as an example, what came out of mm -hmm. the conflagration of the Second World War was the first framework for human rights globally. I mean, we'd never had anything like that. The 1948 Declaration on the Human Right, uh, on, on Human Rights, um, and so on. Uh, a whole legal body of jurisprudence came together. What can come out of COVID is an understanding that, number one, we are are playing fast and loose with nature. We are killing nature. We're destroying our forests and our wetlands and our soils and most particularly our, our waterways. And we're, we, we, this must stop. And this is the hopeful part because I've written about this in, the, in a new book that I've just written on hope, that there is a, 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 what I call a tsunami of understanding that we have to stop destroying nature. We have to restore watersheds and so on. But the other thing that I think that came through very, very clearly is that um, those people living in places where they don't have access to clean water. And when I'm talking, when I tell you, you're talking about kids at school, no toilets, no, no, no place to wash their hands. I'm talking about health clinics. There are studies that show anywhere in certain countries, anywhere from a quarter to over half the health clinics don't have running water. Can you imagine that in any case, but then try adding coronavirus 
complications to that. And I think what it's done is it's, it's simplified a lot of things for a lot of us. What, what do we value? What matters? How can we hold on to what we have? How can we restore what we've destroyed? How can we um, change our, our, how can we adapt and think about values that are not so materialistic? And, and I, I think everybody I know has gone through this kind of metamorphosis. I think it's been profound. And one of the things is it, it has shown the light on the, the human, the lack of human rights to, to water. We have over, well over 2 billion people who are forced to drink contaminated water every day because they don't have access to clean water. 2.5 billion don't have base, the most basic sanitation, you know, even more basic than the, the, the you know, they're literally defecating in a, a lake or a ditch somewhere. Um, we have over, well over 3.5 million people dying every year of waterborne disease. It's the biggest killer of children. Um, including all forms of violence, including war, put together, waterborne disease kills more children. One of the positive things that may have come out of this virus is this this pandemic is that I, I, I don't have reports on this, but I think it's being worked on at the UN, but I have anecdotal evidence that a number of the aid agencies and government aid programs for the coronavirus in the global south has gone to sanitation and to permanent sanitation, realizing that this pandemic, a future pandemic, whatever, just like the argument about vaccines. So we're all vaccinated, or a lot, most of us in the so-called first world. But if, it, if we don't care or don't, or don't ensure that those vaccines reach those in other countries, nobody's safe. Even if you don't care, which of course we do, but so if, even if you don't, it'll come back to you. And we can't leave this situation uh, uh, as it is. So. The, uh, if there's a silver lining here, and that's why I made the comparison to the Second World War, because what silver lining could have come out of such horror? Well, knowing that it must never happen again is, is one thing, right? Um, and what, what, what we need to do now is my goal, my long-term goal, I talk, talk about turning the world blue one community at a time, is to have clean, safe, public, accessible, affordable water everywhere. That's got to be the goal. And if we have that as a goal, then we're going to build in certain kinds of legislation. We're going to bring in certain kind of policies. If we think, well, those millions are uh, expendable, we don't care, then you're going to bring in different kind of policies and you're going to use water in a different way. So it's really important to assess and assert that value. And I think coronavirus, the coronavirus pandemic has helped us clarify um, these issues. Yeah, it's a wake-up call for sure, and uh, how, and how we put together the means to first identify and then address the challenge is very important. Let's go to the building blocks. Our Institute for New Economic Thinking obviously is centered in the economics profession. A lot of people emphasize markets because they say if something is scarce in high demand, then pricing will help people conserve. Others say it, the incentives from pricing will inspire innovation and investment and expand the supply. On the other hand, there is a great deal of awareness, and I often point back to an old part of the history of economic thought of the time of Adam Smith. A man called the Earl of Lauderdale said, what do you mean air and water have no value? If you turn them off, we all die. He was pointing out what they continued to argue is the difference between exchange value on the one hand and use value. And most painfully, when you will not survive if you don't have access to something, people can really exploit you. They can, how do you say, back you up against your despair and extract a great deal from you. And they do. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I saw the big water tank in Highland Park free the water that the young people drew on as people were shutting off the water throughout that city during the time of the bankruptcy. I saw the Flint water crisis close hand and, and I don't want to be too simplistic, but I was scratching my head because Flint is so close to Lake Huron. I used to sail on Lake Huron. You could take a ladle and put it in that lake and have a drink. And uh, this was back in the 70s. I don't know if the water's deteriorated, but the idea that 
you're having this crisis that close to that shoreline. It's almost like I wanted to buy everyone a kayak so they could just ride out with a glass and take some out of the lake. But when human systems get involved, this is the other side. When human systems get involved, it really can be exploited and not for good. So how do we resolve the role of these mechanisms, perhaps in improving things on the one side versus the angst about exploitation and neglect and exacerbating painful inequality on the other? Well, for one thing, I think we need to distinguish between saying that we're going to put a price on water as in buying the water or owning the water, which actually exists in some places, Australia, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Chile are the two biggest examples of this, where they've actually taken the water, separated from the land, given people the right to buy and sell it, and so the prices have just gone through the roof and, and people can't afford it. There's a difference between that and asking for a service charge for the clean water that comes into your home and the <laughs> wastewater service that goes out. You're not owning the water. It's still a, a commons, a, a public trust, a, <laughs> some, a human right, but you're, you're paying for the service. So I don't think anyone is saying, we are all saying no one should be denied water because they, if they're too poor to pay. And, and you, know, you need to know there are many thousands every single year in the United States who get their water cut off. It wasn't just in Detroit. Um, from uh, from an inability to pay. So we believe strongly that there need to be mechanisms to, to help work out payment uh, schedules for people who can't pay. But we're not talking about free water. Uh, of course, we're going to pay a, a service charge for that service that, that costs a lot of money to bring clean water into my home. Now, what you're asking, Rob, is terribly important distinction here. Is water a commodity? or is it a commons, is it a public trust? And this is very important because we have declining water sources in our world. You read these headlines every day, the Middle East is running out of water, Indonesia is running out of water, 11 major cities in China, or sorry, in India are going to be out of water, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 22 countries in Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we are in water crisis. If you look at this, this, the, the graphs at the, at the UN and others, the, the, the demand for water is going straight up and the supply is going straight down arrows in two different set areas. We need desperately to say that water is a, a, a must be a protected commons that we come, come together and we make uh, rules about who has access. We should not be allowing unlimited access by big bottled water companies or big fracking companies or whatever to water that we need for life. So we need a hierarchy, a priority of needs for the, the water sources. And it's going to be different if there's more water here. Maybe the rules can be a little looser, but if there's less water here, they should be pretty tight. But if you say that it's a commodity, and many people do, uh, the World Bank basically sees it as a privatized commodity, the big bottled water companies, many of the food companies, we fought this out at the UN, think that and say, the best way to deal with the crisis that I've just described, this human crisis, this, this ecological crisis, is to put a, 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 mar, a, a price on, bring it into the market, bring water into the market, put a price on it, and, and the market will take care of it. Well, that's true, it will. Millions more will die. Uh, many millions more will be permanently ill because they'll never have access to clean water, and those who can afford it will have all the water they need for their swimming pools and golf courses and everything else. If, if that's what we want, if that's the society we want, that's the society we'll get if we, if we think of it that way. Um, there, are, there is a, what I call a continuum of, of ways to see water as a commodity. There's the privatization of water services, which started with Pinochet, the dictator in um, Chile, <laughs> which is being undone now with the new constitution, led by an indigenous woman, by the way, which I think is a very, very lovely um, piece of information. Uh, and and um, at the World Bank, but, but Margaret Thatcher started water privatization in England um, in 1987. And then the World Bank said, well, that's great, then we'll just take that model and we'll only give funding to for poor countries that need uh, water infrastructure and water services. We'll, we'll only give the money if they bring in a private company. And they brought in these big 
company, Suez and Veolia and so on. And there were water wars all over, particularly all over Latin America, because the deal would be private mm -hmm. between the elites in the country and the World Bank and the, and the CEOs of these companies and the local people. The prices would go through the roof. Uh, the services would be terrible. Um, and we actually, there's been such a fight back against privatized water services that there are now 337 cities in the world, many of them large, like Paris and Berlin, that tried water privatization and have brought water back under public management. Then you get to the next level, which I talked briefly about a minute ago, which is where you're actually buying and selling the actual water. And we have that in the American West with the first in time, first in right system, mm -hmm. which is not working and California has to go back to the basics, back to the basics and, and, and redefine its law. The loss that were made to bring people and ranchers and miners and businesses and settlers out to California 150 years ago should not be applying to a, uh, to a state that's running out of water, right? Um, so we, so, but that notion of separating water and then selling it brings it a, a, a tad closer to what I call then the financialization of water. Now you have water assets. Uh, you can, on the stock market, you can, you can bid. Uh, you can make money on, on the water crisis. And then the latest is the um, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which has allowed, mm -hmm. they allowed Bitcoin uh, futures and then they allow water futures so we're just starting with California and basically what you're doing you're no longer buying and selling the actual water you're buying water futures so you're saying well I think there's a drought here jeepers do I ever pick up a newspaper that there isn't a leading story on the crisis in California maybe I'll buy a whole whack of water futures and then I'll hold on to it and of course I'll make a fortune in a few years and they actually have the nerve to claim some of these companies that they're doing this to help conserve water. I mean, explain how that would happen, right? And who's got the money for that? It's the big banks. It's the big uh, equity funds. It's the big investors. It's the big agribusiness companies. It's not you and me. It's not the small farmers who desperately need it. It's not the small ind indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, if, if that's allowed to continue, you're going to see more and more control of water in the hands of people who know nothing about water nothing about the environment, nothing about sustainability, couldn't care less. I don't mean as individuals, maybe they're nice people as individuals, but it's the dead hand of the market. They have to make money. There's no reason they would be there if they're not going to make a profit from it. So it's very important from a perspective of our movement, our global social uh, water justice movement, that we say very clearly that water is a public trust. Um, that we need laws and controls to protect water as a public trust, as a, as a, as a commons, um, that we need laws and, and priorities around who has access and why. I mean, why, are, why do we have bottled water, foreign bottled water companies coming in and taking our bottled water when the water coming out of our taps is clean and safe? It's, it's just, we need to ask these hard questions. We are, Rob, I can't say this strongly enough, a planet running out of of, of accessible clean water. And it isn't just climate change. We always hear, oh, it's climate change created this drought. Well, maybe, sure, I had a hand in it, but it could also be because you damned the rivers all to death and you pulled up your groundwater way faster than nature can replenish it. The Ogallala Aquifer is going to be gone in our lifetime. I, people don't understand that technology that they developed after the Second World War, the circular uh, uh, groundwater technology that green the, the deserts, that'll be gone. And when it's gone, what will we use? What will people use? Well, everybody's going to turn to the Great Lakes, I can tell you that. So we need to say water is a, a public trust, a commons, and a human right. And then you start to say, well, then what priorities do we place on it and who has authority over access and who has a, should be allowed to dump their toxins into this water. In my country, two governments ago, but it hasn't been undone, the government of the time allowed mining companies to apply to the government to rename a lake a tailings impoundment area so it would no longer be protected by our legislation, which is the Fisheries Act, the same as your Clean Water Lake Act. And there's dozens of them, these beautiful lakes that are now just dump sites for mining waste, mm -hmm. but they're not protected because they've been renamed Presto, they're not la uh, lakes anymore. So this is how the law can work when, the, when we're not clear about 
We need water for life. We're a planet running out of water. You can have all the human rights in the world if you, if you don't have the water there. Uh, people are going to go without. And it isn't just in the global south, Robin. It's really important to say this. We, I was in Los Angeles a year and a half ago when it became a blue community, which is when a municipality vows to protect water as a human right and to protect not to and promise not to privatize it and to protect it as a, as a commons. And they also promise to phase out bottled water, plastic bottled water on municipal premises and events and so on. Uh, there are a, a million people in the Los An greater Los Angeles area that don't have access to clean water and sanitation. That, yep. you know, we're talking, yep. not talking a country on the other side of the world. We're talking right here. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of a mindset. And when you say, when we come to an agreement that water is not running shoes, although I want everybody to have shoes, you know, but water isn't isn't cars you know water is essential for life it's limited it's the same it's not only the same amount of water it's the same water that was in the blood of dinosaurs we must take care of it we absolutely must and making it sing to the tune of the of the market is wrong now as i say that and you mentioned earlier if it's valued as nothing what does that mean and there is a movement to put a price not by charging for water or nature but to try to assess and this is being done actually in lots of places in the US and my country Canada trying to, to put a dollar figure on what a forest is worth or what a lake is worth the service it provides and where I, I understand the, th the thinking of the good people behind that, because what they want is to be able to say, well, in a, a competitive market, you could, that force is giving us clean air, you know, it's protecting the water, it's, it's a carbon sink. Uh, I, I can show you in dollar cents, uh, dollar cents, you know, what, why we should keep it. Well, what if it's full of walnut trees and I can, and somebody comes along and says, I can make more money on it than, than the dollar amount you put on it. it so it's a double-edged sword, and I think we need to be really careful when we talk about nat natural assets or nature, the ass assets of nature or nat natural cap nat natural capital. You hear that language, then you start hearing about well, like we have um, you know carbon offsets. Now you're hearing about water pollution trading which has started in Chesapeake Bay in your country. And mm -hmm. then you get out, then you're using the market and you're using the argument that we need to protect water by putting a price on it. You're using it to bring it into the market on the market's terms. And I think that's a potential slippery it's slope. True. It needs to be, I quote Martin Luther King, who said legislation may not change the, the, the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. We need the yes, rule of law. Yes, yes. And I would point your your um, your listeners to Food and Water Watch uh, in the United States is the really, really fine organization and full disclosure, I'm on the board, um, uh, that's fighting for good law for water and, and food. And there's the proposing a, what's called a water act, uh, water affordability, uh, investment in, in infrastructure and so on. Um, that really people can get behind because uh, uh, one of the worries right now in, in your country is as um, municipalities are so strapped with particularly through the COVID crisis that these private water companies are coming in and saying we'll give you money and we'll take over the you know we'll take over your water mm -hmm. services and if you don't have any money uh, you know you feel you don't have a choice. I had a how would I say a premonition of that experience because at the time of the Detroit bankruptcy, they wanted to have, a, I believe it was a French company, Suez, take over Detroit water and sewage so that they could lay off all the employees and not pay them a pension and create a windfall for themselves. And somehow this was solving the problem. Activists obviously stopped and thwarted that very quickly, but, uh, but you're right how the, what you might call the private interests may not see the entire which you might call social ramification of what they pursue. One of the things at, at INET that a lot of people are concerned about is the pretend notion that markets and politics are separable domains. 
and what I often refer to in these podcasts as the commodification of social design and enforcement becomes the problem because if money plays too big a role in politics, it's hard to imagine what you might call the architect or the referee being able to design or enforce and implement something which has the uh, what you might call characteristics of the common good. And everything gets refracted by money, as does some information that comes through advertising, as does some education when schools are dependent on money. So how we get to people with truth, vision, design, inspiration, to fuel activism, is many times outside the system. It's people like you. And, uh, it, but I'm very, very concerned. I, I read lots of history of thought, but someone like Carl Pogliani, the Great Transformation, there was almost this sense that markets were overdone and government would be good and the New Deal kind of showed that rebalancing, at least for white people. And, uh, but the notion that somehow now people in America who are progressives would say, let's have more government. A lot of them think government is captured. And some of the strength that libertarians have is that they say, we can't rely on government. The system is rigged. And I think that's part of why Donald Trump was so popular in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. So I guess this is a long-winded way of leading to a question. How do you maintain your stamina and your perseverance with the vision and the ideas that you have, but the which you might call challenges of implementation. How do, how do you, how do you maintain your resolve? Well, just, I'm going to go back. I'm not going to forget your question, but I want to just say that I was in Detroit many times over that issue. And I don't know if you ever remember reading that a group of Canadians brought public water over to Detroit to the, yes, that yes, was us. Yes, that was yes. my organization. Wow. Wow. wow oh yeah. Wow. And so the Homeland that. Security guys at the border were not, you know, they knew we were coming. And I mean, what were we bringing? Great big jugs of water. Of course it didn't make a difference. It was totally symbolic, but it was the most beautiful meeting of activists, yeah, yeah. mostly African-Americans, because uh, that's who's, who's on the, Yes, yes. End of the, you know, the shot, the cutoffs are, are poor people, older people, mm -hmm. uh, people of color. Yeah. Um, it was just a very, very moving event where we just, you know, we, we exchanged. We said, this is clean public water, our gift to you and, 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 and your right to have this. Mm -hmm. you no, know, your question is really important. I often look to my own country as it was at a particular time, not now when I think we, we found a, a balance between private and public, um, because I'm not against the private sector. I don't want governments making running shoes, speaking of running shoes or cars or whatever. Um, we have a very big country and a lot of it's cold and a lot of it's still remote. And governments realized that if they were going to provide healthcare services or be able to move people one place or another or deliver mail or wherever, they had to have public services because they just you couldn't make enough money going into remote areas in a you know as a private industry so we had what i call a mixed economy and the question was what is you know render on to caesar that which is caesar's and 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 what is appropriate for the government to be doing and providing and you know the collective and what and where do you want the entrepreneurship to come from because i think there's in the water area there's a whole lot of exciting stuff happening coming from the private sector around um, new technology. So you don't want to dampen that. Uh, and I, I still, for me, I don't know how to put it, it doesn't sound very exciting or romantic, but that balance is something that I think we're trying to seek. I do believe with all my heart that people have the right to good governance. And if they don't have it now, that doesn't mean they should give up on it and we should not be cynical. We should not be cynical. We should be. We should get up every morning and say, "My right to good governance continues," and this bad government, or maybe you know, that bad government or whatever, we can change. We can do something about. It. I do think I have to say in your country that your new president um, and his party cares. Are they perfect? Nope. 
Uh, but I think you're going to, I think, I think Biden, President Biden sees things through new eyes. I'm heartbroken mm -hmm. with everybody else with what he's going through in, in, in Afghanistan and so on. But I think, you know, the who picked up the whole neoliberal, conservative, give the markets everything, the full free trade agreement, never saw a free trade agreement that I didn't love. It was Bill Clinton and it was Obama. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the Democrats, the, 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 you know, sounding cool and being cool and saying all the right things, but giving so much power to the corporations and listening mm -hmm. so much to, to big oil and big fracking and, and the big investors. And, and we know who they were listening to. We know who gave them money. Uh, and I have some feeling, some faith that this president wants to change that, wants to, wants to reverse courses and wants deeply to put America back on an, a new path. Again, not to squash, squish or whatever the word is, uh, entrepreneurship and, and exciting mm -hmm. ideas, not to do that, but to ask that vital question, what is the role of government? Um, public education, renewing public uh, public health, mm -hmm. uh, all the things that we need for a good life. I don't know if you've been reading uh, Kate Roweth, um, the the donut economy concept. She's an economist. Mm -hmm. I love her. Uh, I, I know her. Yes. yes. Okay. She's yes, an yes. economist. Well, then you'll know her work. And her basically, she says, rather than the growth economy, which is the straight up or straight down we'd have a, a donut shaped economy and on the outside are all of the environmental um, th thresholds we cannot we cannot uh, break I mean th this is the planet this is this is life being sustained mm -hmm. what do we need to do to protect that on the inside are all the things that we humans need uh, the real things we need not all the stuff we may want yes, yes. Um, and 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 she calls the sweet spot is that is that part in between and how we get there uh, I, I think we need to have that kind of thinking and I'm I'm hopeful in your country that you've got a government with with that kind of vision um, and not to say there aren't problems in the Democratic Party and not disagreements I can every you can see them from anywhere on earth right but I, I do believe that there's an understanding this giving everything to the corporations look you want to know how I got into into the water issue nothing to do with the environment it wasn't even specifically to do with human rights it was reading the Canada US free trade agreement in 1985 mm -hmm. between President Reagan and Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who was a Reagan type, mm -hmm. and they yep, came yep. up with the first modern free trade agreement in the world. And by free trade, they didn't mean nice, take down some borders and take down some quotas. And no, they meant give over to the market all the decisions about finance, about the market, about the economy, and governments will have a smaller and smaller and smaller role. And with every new trade agreement, governments are reduced. I was at the <coughs> Battle of Seattle in 1999 mm -hmm. and you know got tear gassed and everything uh it was an, an amazing event uh and i remember when bill clinton called called the the head of the wto and said shut it down shut it down he didn't want you know they, there were thousands of reporters from all over the world and they were sending stories home on child poverty and and the environmental destruction and the right and human rights and, and the rights of working people instead of you know the glories of the market but it was clinton who loved that stuff and in our in our country it was it was the liberal party just as much maybe more than the conservative party so we have a lot of questions for these neoliberals in these so-called progressive parties and i think that's part of why so many people were so angry and voted for donald trump because they yeah, nafta came along and you know, just took the rug out. Anyway, I started to tell you about water. So back in 1985, I'm reading the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which was the predecessor to NAFTA, because NAFTA then included Mexico. I'm looking at the at the um, annex at the back that that gave a list of all of the goods, tradable goods that were to be now disciplined by the new trade agreement, which is basically governments get your hands off. These are free trade goods. These are the things that are going to be traded without government interference. And there was water in all its forms, including ice and snow. And Rob, I can mm. remember looking at it and thinking, what? <laughs> water? Yeah. Water? And 
And we had been fighting a couple of huge proposals to move and commercially move pipe by pipeline water from Canada's north or from Quebec through the Great Lakes to California and the, Texas and the thirsty parts of the United States, not as a humanitarian thing, very much, you know, as a commercial enterprise. <laughs> and we had stopped these water exports. And when I looked at that, I thought, that's what this is about. That is about freeing up or removing, I should say, government right to interfere in the commercial export of our water. Ditto with our energy. We signed what's called proportional sharing, which meant we couldn't have our own rules for our own energy. It was absolutely outrageous that we did that. So that's what got me interested. I, I thought, boy, I don't understand. And it set me on a journey, which then took me all over the world from the slums of the poorest communities in the world to the UN, mm -hmm. understanding that this is a fundamental fight around a human right to something that we need for life. Um, and it should not be in a free trade agreement. And shame on anybody who thought that you could trade water like running shoes. I keep using that example and think mm -hmm. that it's the same thing. But that's how I got involved. It was because mm -hmm. that notion of neoliberal, uh, you know, free for all, the market knows everything, corporations are the best. Do you know of the world's 100 leading economies, 69 are corporations? 31 are countries. What does that tell you? How much power these corporations have? You ask me how I keep going. I keep going because there's such a wonderful group of people around the world, in my country, in my community, and around the world who have formed a bond. As my new book, I talk a lot about this. It's called, it's not out yet. It's called Still Hopeful lessons from a lifetime of activism and i talk about the need to see the long view you know you may it may not happen in your lifetime it may take longer than that and you don't know what's a win you think this is the goal you have well maybe you didn't get there but you built a wonderful movement you got a whole bunch of young people you brought in you know you educated a whole new group you met a whole new group of people you you, you moved something you might not have understood and the the fruits of that will come at a different time it's understanding that the need to disconnect from if I didn't, if I wasn't successful, then to hell with it, I'm going to go away. No, you just, you can't have that kind of view. You must have hope or what one American uh, philosopher calls wise hope. It's not Pollyanna-ish, oh, everything's fine, mm -hmm. so don't worry. Uh, and it's real hope uh, and you have to allow for grief and you have to allow for burnout and, and watch for it and be kind. I talk a lot in my book about the need to be kind to one another because we don't tend to be that kind to each other in our sometimes in our movements. You know, uh, if you're if you're fighting something too big, well, I'll fight you instead because it you know you're small fry and I can I can turn on you instead. So the need for us to come together. But I am hopeful. Um, out of the as I said earlier, out of the coronavirus crisis is a, a new awareness of the need for sanitation in places that don't have it and permanent sanitation out of this is coming a new consciousness of our global connections i mean you we are one human family and 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 i feel that that's um that's been very very clear uh and just the the we just owe it i mean i live in i'm not rich i'm middle class i guess but i live in a, a safe city I was given opportunities that many people weren't. I recognize that parts, part of it is the color of my skin and you know when and where I was raised. And I feel I have a responsibility not to give up because to give up is to give, in to, is to give up on behalf of people around the world who are in desperate situations and who need us to continue to care, support them in any way we can, whether it's funding or, or sharing technology or you know just being there for them we to give up because i'm petulant or i didn't get all my way is to give up for people who who need us and uh, and anyway there's nothing nicer than getting up in the morning and caring something about something besides yourself <laughs>